Mr. President, I believe the present Declaration of Human Rights is a document of the first order of importance. While history alone can determine the historic significance of an event, it is safe to say that the declaration before us may be destined to occupy an honorable place in the procession of positive landmarks in human history. Whether it will actually do so or not depends primarily on whether a sufficient number of morally and politically powerful countries will so identify themselves with its doctrine in all sincerity and truth as to use it as a potent weapon in the keen ideological warfare which is the mark of the contemporary scene. How the present text before you has actually come into being. Acting in accordance with the responsibility expressly placed upon it by the Charter of the United Nations, the Economic and Social Council created a Commission on Human Rights on the 16th of February 1946. It decided that the work of the Commission should be directed toward submitting proposals, recommendations, and reports, first of all, on an international bill of human rights. At first, the Commission consisted of a nucleus of nine members appointed in their individual capacity. Among these were Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt of the United States, Monsieur René Cassin, of France and Mr. K. C. Neoji of India, who served respectively as chairman, vice chairman, and rapporteur of the nuclear body. They met. Fellow delegates, the long and meticulous study and debate of which this Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the product means that it reflects the composite views of the many men and governments who have contributed to its formulation. Not every man nor every government can have what he wants in a document of this kind. There are, of course, particular provisions in the Declaration before us with which we are not fully satisfied. I have no doubt this is true of other delegations. And it would still be true if we continued our labors over many years. Taken as a whole, the delegation of the United States believes that this is a good document, even a great document, and we propose to give it our full support. Think on this. The Soviet amendment of Article 22 introduces new elements into the article without improving the committee text and again introduces specific reference to discrimination 
As was repeatedly pointed out in Committee 3, the question of discrimination is comprehensively covered in Article 2 of the Declaration, so that its restatement elsewhere is completely unnecessary and also has the effect of weakening the comprehensive principles stated in Article 2. The new article proposed by the Soviet delegation is but a restatement of state obligation which the Soviet delegation attempted to introduce into practically every article in the Declaration. It would convert the Declaration into a document stating obligations on states, thereby changing completely its character as a statement of principles to serve as a common standard of achievement for the members of the United Nations. The Soviet proposal for deferring consideration of the Declaration to the fourth session of the Assembly requires no comment. An identical text was rejected in Committee 3 by vote of six in favor and 26 against. We are all agreed, I am sure, that the Declaration, which has been worked on with such great effort and devotion and over such a long period of time, must be approved by this Assembly at this session. In giving our approval to the Declaration today, it is of primary importance that we keep clearly in mind the basic character of the document. It is not a treaty, it is not an international agreement, it is not and does not purport to be a statement of law or of legal obligation. It is a declaration of basic principles of human rights and freedoms to be stamped with the approval of the General Assembly by formal vote of its members and to serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples of all nations. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We hope its proclamation by the General Assembly will be an event comparable to the proclamation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man by the French people in 1789, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the people of the United States, and the adoption of comparable declarations at different times in other countries, at a time when there are so many issues on which we find it difficult to reach a common basis of agreement it is a significant fact that 58 states have found such a large measure of agreement in the complex field of human rights. This must be taken as testimony of our common aspiration, first voiced in the Charter of the United Nations, to lift men everywhere to a higher standard of life and to a greater enjoyment of freedom. Man's desire for peace lies behind this declaration. The realization that the flagrant violation of human rights by Nazi and fascist countries sowed the seeds of the last world war has supplied the impetus for the work which brings us to the moment of achievement here today. On the spiritual fact that man must have freedom in which to develop his full stature and through common effort to raise the level of human dignity. We have much to do to fully achieve and to assure the rights set forth in this declaration, but having them put before us with the moral backing of 58 nations will be a great step forward. In conclusion, I feel that I cannot do better than to repeat the call to action by Secretary Marshall in his opening statement to this assembly. 
Let this third regular session of the General Assembly approve by an overwhelming majority the Declaration of Human Rights as a standard of conduct for all. And let us, as members of the United Nations, conscious of our own shortcomings and imperfections, join our effort in good faith to live up to this high standard. Thank you. Señor Presidente, señores delegados, en pocas horas más, las 58 naciones aquí representadas promulgarán la primera declaración internacional de los derechos del hombre. Tal acto, por su trascendencia, justificará por sí solo la tercera sesión de la Asamblea General de las Naciones Unidas. De ahora en adelante, todos los seres humanos sabrán que el patrimonio de sus derechos esenciales tiene significados específicos y definidos. Sabrán a ciencia cierta sin equívoco posible, en qué consisten la dignidad y los derechos que tienen en igualdad desde su nacimiento. Monsieur le Président, L'Assemblée des Générales des Nations Unies est sur le point de clore sa session en statuant sur le projet de déclaration que la Commission a voulu faire appeler « Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme ». J'ai l'honneur d'apporter la ferme adhésion de la France à cet acte historique qui, Cent ans après la révolution de 48 et l'abolition de l'esclavage sur toutes les terres françaises constitue une étape mondiale dans le long combat pour les droits de l'homme. Notre déclaration se présente comme la plus vigoureuse, la plus nécessaire des protestations de l'humanité contre les atrocités et les oppressions dont tant de millions d'êtres humains ont été victimes à travers les siècles et plus particulièrement pendant et entre les deux guerres. La guerre dernière a revêtu le caractère d'une croisade des droits de l'homme qui a été imposée au peuple libre par les tenants du fascisme et du racisme, aussi ennemi de l'homme qu'il l'était des autres nations et de la communauté internationale. Et il n'a pas fallu tellement de courage pour atteindre un tel résultat. La déclaration n'est ni magnanime, ni hardie, ni contemporain dans sa teneur. Elle n'est même pas une promesse. Permettez-moi à cette remarque d'un homme habitué à parler avec respect de l'esprit français. Cette déclaration n'est point concise dans l'esprit français. Nos constitutions rassemblent tous les droits prévus par la déclaration, mais elles ne se bonnent pas à les déclarer, elles les garantissent. C'est pourquoi la délégation tchécoslovaque exigeait constamment que la déclaration des droits de l'homme qui est la première déclaration internationale de ce genre, contient des garanties de réalisation immédiate et progressive des droits déclarés. 
la majorité votante ne considérait comme acceptable que les côtés verbal de la déclaration, en prétextant l'impossibilité de dépasser l'évolution constitutionnelle dans les différents pays, car, paraît-il, cela aurait porté atteinte à l'intégrité des institutions d'État. Il est évident que cette société des votants, très conséquente, a refusé l'amendement soviétique à l'article 14, précisant que les droits de mouvement des choix du lié d'habitation et d'immigration doivent être résolus dans le cadre des lois de chaque État.